Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Ruoff, a faculty member in film and media at Dartmouth. Uh, I'm very grateful to our film video technician, Peter Chardelli, uh, whose name is not showing now on the screen, but he's waving, uh, for organizing our YouTube premiere and uh, this event as well. So welcome to a Q&A uh, with the students from Found Footage, whose work uh, just had its world premiere uh, shortly before this. Uh, I'm proud and excited to discuss their videos. And uh, I, uh, I hope there's a mechanism where people watching can uh, ask uh, questions or make comments. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm going to start uh, by asking uh, each of the students uh, one question, and then we'll move into more of a free-flowing conversation. Uh, and uh, Charlie and Thomas, we're still looking forward to seeing you. Uh, and there you are. Um, and so Abigail, uh, I wanted you. Uh, in Distract Me, took a romantic love song and transformed it into an indictment of uh, reality TV. Um, could you discuss the, the structure of your video and, and how you found it? Yeah, so in the beginning, I wanted to show the more glamorous side of things, how people like America's Next Top Model, how that portrays model life while it's, very unrealistic it's people partying you know rich people celebrities coming to visit when at the same time the same show has people crying all the time ridiculous challenges so i try to progress from glamorous to them doing silly challenges that really have no ref like they have no connection to modeling yet they do them for some reason because it's for the viewers entertainment but you know in the show it's oh it's to keep your um your attention on the modeling and the walking and all that and then i wanted to progress to how this affects people so their crying scenes mm -hmm. and then i wanted to show how on other reality shows this becomes more dangerous when people start doing more dangerous things they start risking their life and how drastically bad this can get so quickly yeah, so I mean, as a follow-up, you know, there's a, there was a, a Roman writer who said, you know, what what the people desire is bread and circuses, uh, and uh, you know, uh, are you suggesting that about reality TV? Yeah, I, it's and like I was in another class and we were talking about comedy, and that's when I realized, like comedy, you you get that from the misery of others. It's always something unfortunate happening to someone else, and you're taking enjoyment from it. Well, I I'll I'll, I'll think about that the next time that uh, <laughs> that I uh, find myself laughing at a film. <laughs> uh, okay, Jack, uh, uh, your video, Trump versus Trump. Uh, amusingly casts our former president as uh, his own best uh, critic. So, and what were the biggest challenges uh, to editing this together? Um, I would say it, there were like two big challenges that happened at different points. The first one was getting all of the clips together because um, I looked through about an hour of the first debate and picked out the clips I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, yeah, that was tedious and difficult to get together. But then later on, once that was done, uh, the hard part was uh, definitely making it more seamless and covering up the little visual um, glitches, some of which still exist. Um, yeah. Uh, and that was just a matter of, I think on the final cut, I explored it five times before I got it right. So. Yeah, I, I, actually, I was going to ask if uh, 
if you had as much fun making this uh, political parody uh, as we do watching it. <laughs> um, the, I, I'm tempted to say no, but that's also because I, I spent enough time on it that like the fun of it kind of burned out at the end of there. <laughs> I, I, that's, you know, that's understandable, I think. Um, okay, so uh, JL, uh, you made an, uh, an eloquent meditation on white supremacy and the struggle for black uh, rights. Um, how did you decide to combine the past and the present? And then also particularly the use of uh, split screens. Um, so as for the past and present part, because you guys helped me a lot with that, because I was, I feel like finding old footage about like racism, discrimination, it feels easier and it also looks aesthetic. But um, again, that's like not current. So I wanted to find stuff that was more modern and more relevant today. So that's hence like this split screen thing. It allowed me to like compare um, past and present moments of racism, discrimination, what be it, um, and yeah. It, it, I think it also has the effect perhaps of making uh, the combination of the voiceover and what we're seeing less uh, literal. Definitely. Because, yeah, that was one of my struggles was I didn't want to make it super literal. Um, and you guys helped me with that. And I also found like in my process, I ended up it going into my own stream of consciousness, kind of just like building upon each video. So that was an interesting thing to like see happen in front of me and like come from myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, OK, uh, Alex Eccles. Uh, your uh, music video vividly uh, explores birth and rebirth as well as pain and love. And um, having chosen the song Wild Time, how did you go about finding the specific animation footage that you wanted? Uh, and, and where did you end up finding it mostly? Um, it was mostly on YouTube. Um, it was, uh, that was kind of the whole process for me. It was just like looking for different videos and seeing what I could make out of things that were like sort of inspiring me. And um, I think during the process, it was really interesting because like the videos definitely changed my idea and like the video that it ended up turning out to be. And um, as you said, it started off being a very uh, reincarnation themed uh, video, but ended up being more about like interpersonal relationships. So um, it was kind of an interesting journey to make the video. Yeah, it's a related thing. Uh, how did you sort of navigate between uh, cutting to the beat of the music and cutting to the lyrics themselves? Um, pacing. Just listening to the song so many times like I really at this point really don't like the song <laughs> but um it's like Jack's experience <laughs> everybody's overdosing on their topics yeah exactly I think if I had to recommend one thing for someone going into making a video is probably pick a song you're okay with not liking anymore after finishing the process <laughs> But again, so were you cutting more to the, the beat or to the lyric? Um, I think to the beat, I tried to like musically um, hear different points where I wanted to see different images and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, Aika, so in, uh, in Symbiotic, you use the film uh, Parasite to craft a movie trailer that skillfully uh, turns the original into a romantic comedy. Uh, why did you choose this particular transformation? Um, first off, I just thought it would be fun to do, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also thought about um, sort of the majority of the 
Korean media that gets exported like to the world like very much presents like a very sanitized view of Korea and very optimistic stories of like love transcending class Mm -hmm. and I thought just kind of how terrible would it be to do that and repackage the one movie that doesn't do that and the one Korean thing that has gained critical acclaim Mm -hmm. and sort of fame that does not present that sanitized view of the world. And uh, this is a a broader question. Uh, Do you think that uh, basically any film could be edited into a movie trailer of a different genre? And if so, why is that the case? Um, I think to an extent, no, because I did also benefit from, like in Parasite, I benefited from the aesthetics also being light and sweet in some parts. And I was lucky that a lot of the audio, there wasn't much background music all the time in Parasite. There was a lot of voiceover with like good, clean audio that I could use. I think there's definitely some stuff that's just impossible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Max, uh, the Yay Experience comically condenses uh, Joe Rogan's interview with Kanye West. Um, What were the most challenging parts of finding sort of the flow and structure of uh, this piece? Uh, Yeah, I think it was difficult to um, like change it into something that didn't also look like an interview because if you like just think about what it originally was without having seen it, you're probably going to expect that it was kind of ridiculous. So it wasn't that big of a departure in like topic or narrative at the end. Okay, uh, and and in terms of the structure, oh right, yeah, um, yeah, it uh, probably the challenges were cutting back and forth between them. There's only like three or four times that Joe Rogan is actually on screen, just motionless or uh, in a place where you could like put him in like an awkward position, just because Kanye talks so much throughout the whole three-hour interview. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as a as a follow-up, more general question, sort of working. You know, with the nuts and bolts of uh, of editing, um, has that changed the way that you uh, look at films and television shows? And yeah, yeah. So uh, we were talking about this. Obviously, I don't. I'm like barely scratching the surface of all of this stuff. But it, like sometimes I just get distracted by the transitions because I was so worried about like the flashes in mine, and that's like the like there's even more obvious stuff out there in real media, but it, it, it can be distracting, yeah. So you find yourself now watching the, the editing and the cutting of shows and you, so you're sort of at, at one remove from yeah. the- Yeah, just a bit, yep. Uh, viewer, okay, yeah. Um, Charlie, uh, in your magical music video of uh, Younger. Why did you restrict yourself to uh, using only footage from commercials? Thank you for your question, Jeff. Um, I would say Tom's song, Younger, kind of the whole notion of it is like the quote, I'm getting younger, which is kind of like this realization that at like the childhood imagination is one of like the most purest forms of of being that you can have in a way Mm -hmm. um and as you get older you kind of lose that and so he's playing with that i'm getting older by saying he's getting younger now to go off of that i also realized like from a young age we're kind of taught to like replace that childhood imagination with products like in this consumer based society and so you see a lot of commercials pandering to people's like spirit of imagination particularly children but but everybody and replacing it with like this want for a product that will give you what the imagination once did and so i wanted to restrict myself to commercials to create sort of this imaginative thing that Mm -hmm. could reflect the childhood imagination while also like subvertly making it out of the thing that is meant to destroy it so it's kind of a windy road um and i hope that made at least a little bit of sense and i didn't sound too too wild (laughs) yeah so you're uh, 
at, at, at one, uh, in one sense, you're faithful to the song. And then in another way, you, you add an, an additional layer to it. Yeah, a lot of layers, I get like yeah. a cake. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, Mia, uh, in, uh, Mia, 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 Mia is not here. Hi. Oh, you are. There you are. Sorry. <laughs> in graduation day, you've uh, produced an inspirational uh, supercut of graduation speeches. Uh, and my initial question is, um, you know, at what point did you decide to go away from the speeches themselves and incorporate other types of material? Um, initially, it was really because I wasn't having enough content, I think, and I didn't want um, my supercut to rely too much on just a few or just a handful of graduation speeches. Mm -hmm. um, so with the nature of the supercut, taking phrases and sentences from different speeches, um, I kind of challenged myself to reimagine some of the speeches that aren't connected to graduation and try to combine those in a way that still left that sort of inspirational message. So partly uh, it, it allowed you to use audio that is not from graduation speeches. And then partly it also, you know, uh, touches upon the things that people are referring to in the speeches themselves. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Natan, um, your video beautifully uh, explores a, a relationship with, uh, with nature. Um, and I was uh, curious as to why that, you know, for you uh, was, you, you know, uh, of such powerful significance. Absolutely. I mean, I think there are, uh... A multitude of different reasons why I'm feeling this way about nature and, and feeling the way of, of one is COVID I would say and the pandemic and being in, in quarantine has really realigned myself with like you know the only thing that I could turn to in this time was, was sanity was going on hikes or meditating or um, you know going to the beach things like that um, has really been able to has been my ability to stay centered and stay focused um, but a more intimate uh, relationship with it is that my family's pretty split. We have, um, you know, we still keep some practices of Tainos, uh, which is the indigenous people of the Caribbean. Uh, mm -hmm. But then we also have this, these, these traditions that are brought down from, um, from slavery and other things like that. Uh, religious traditions like with Santeria uh, mm -hmm. coming from Africa and the mix that with European uh, Christian religion. So there's a mix of different practices, religions that we practice. Um, but at its core, at its center, it's finding that uh that frequency or that vibration with nature and being in tune with that and really realizing that uh we are one with it instead of and we have to live in harmony with it and it's not one that we live off of it um but we live in harmony with it and that we are a component of this larger picture uh we essentially we share a soul with nature uh mm -hmm. and one thing that i find beautiful is that th those traditions have remained consistent throughout generations regardless of the mass genocide of 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 my of you know my ancestors. So I think like those traditions being to be able to be able to like and they're passed down not through books, they're passed down through uh, just practices and folk tales and uh, the way it's taught. So I really wanted to emphasize that with this music video and change completely the dynamic of the song because the song is about a, a guy's relationship with his father. Um, so it's really in his family. And um, I think reinventing that whole just because I wanted the chorus on the level, it's really reaching that full level of human frequency. Um, so I wanted to transform the, the, the meaning of that song with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you did. Uh, Alex uh, Schmidt, um, for your uh, entertaining uh, supercut of quotes uh, from movies, uh, could you describe the final structure that you ended up finding for organizing this, you know, multitude of clips? Yeah, well, first off, um, I wanted to make sure to find like as many, many clips and many uh, quotes like I could um, that related or that had the I am or I'm starting mm -hmm. with it. And my whole like idea was to say, or like show how 
even though this like start of a quote can be like so small and so simple, it can be like been, it can be done like so many different ways, be used in so many different ways. And um, like the overall variety of such like a simple thing could actually branch off into uh, like so many different meetings. And um, my, if, if you're able to like notice it, the first part is like mo the mainly like uh, introductions and then it like shifts into more like villain, like bad guy kind of a um, quotes. And mm -hmm. then it shifts into hero. And then uh, the last, there's three more that's, it was um, more like statement quotes mm -hmm. of like characters that would uh, in movies, nothing like it depend. There was some that were like, like just statements, like nothing too serious. And then there are other ones that were, um, if like, you know, the movie, you realize that like actually holds a little more meaning. And then um, like to give it going next to, to give it like a little contrast I moved into the, like comedic funny quotes and then shifted to the end with a more like uh i guess in a way uh realization kind of quotes for uh, characters and films and mm -hmm. uh that like things that they say that at, while you're watching the film you realize that like um it helped that character to understand who they are and like what is going on in uh, mm -hmm. that point of the film yeah yeah, no, I think that came through uh, powerfully. Um, so uh, Thomas and uh, Thatcher, you guys work together uh, on a, a music video that very uh, powerfully moves from the suffragists in 1912 to Black Lives Matter in 2020. Uh, and so what were the connections you wanted to explore uh, across a century and also really worldwide, uh, given the scope of the piece? It's a great question, Jeff. I'll take that one. Um, I think the real common theme that we saw throughout all of this was how different these movements were and who was involved in them in the time periods that they took place in, but at the same time, how common they were and how common you can see just visually the themes are throughout all of them that while well, these protests are protesting very different things and are seeking at, I mean, at a fundamental level, they're all seeking um, a greater access to human rights. They all do look very similar, even though they're very kind of different people who are participating in them. I think we were trying to highlight that commonality and trying to show a general picture, um, but also just kind of a powerful picture of what it means to seek freedom and what it means to fight for one's rights. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, yeah. that comes across. And just to add on to that, I feel like we we're really trying to show the universal, like the universality of the struggle for freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and that was like, I feel most clear towards the end when we showed like the international protest for BLM. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like culminating in that really, really drove that home. I think that's what we were going for. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, well, Thomas, what was it like collaborating uh, since the two of you, you know, worked together on this uh, project? And, you know, can you talk about what, whatever brainstorming and then sort of logistical uh, uh, parts there were to that? Yeah, so I feel like at the beginning, um, the main thing is like reconciling different viewpoints and trying to find like a common, common opinion on where we wanted to take it. Um, so at first, like that was a little difficult, I would say, but once we had a shared idea of where we wanted to take it, I feel like collaborating did make it a lot easier, especially with like finding footage um, and all that kind of stuff, because finding footage, at least for me, was a little hard because like everything's watermarked. Um, but we ended up using like a lot of YouTube and stuff, but overall, I think collaborating once we got over that initial, in, like initial obstacle was, was definitely worth it. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, it looked like it on, on screen. Uh, so, um, you know, okay, here's kind of a more general question and maybe a, a few of you could uh, answer. Uh, you know, we, when, when, when people think of uh, filmmakers or films, you know, they, they often typically think of actors and actresses, they think of directors, perhaps they think about producers or maybe writers. Um, after taking this class, how would you describe uh, the creative significance uh, of editors? 
Charlie, you want to have a? Yeah, I can. I can take that. Um, I definitely newfound understanding uh, awe of what they do. And for me, I was always like, okay, whoever makes a video, like the writer makes the video, right? And then the director like follows what the writer does, and then the editor is just like there as the person. You're like, here, take this and just you know put it together. But it's already pretty much together. I in this class, I learned that the editor probably has maybe the most power out of anyone. Yeah, um, I can I, I can agree with that because you can just it really speaks to how I mean depend no matter what the project is that the editor is working on, like even if it's like the most tedious thing or not that not that much no matter what like it's still still a great amount of work and takes a lot of different steps to actually get it right and like make sure that the final project or product is exactly how it needs to be and um like successful for for the editor and uh whoever is going to be watching it but yeah it really really gives like a newfound uh like i guess a uh, appreciation for what what they do yeah yeah, yeah, I was, Ike and Jack, I was gonna ask because the two of you were, you know, most involved in transforming something into sort of something else. Uh, so Ika? Yeah, um, I think the special thing about film um, more than like other art forms is that it really like takes you on an emotional journey and almost like guides you on how you can feel about something. And like, that's especially true about movies. And I think as an editor, you, you almost have the most control on like what kind of emotional journey you're taking a viewer on. And like, that's especially true with like a trailer and with background music and the visuals. So I think that's really special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Jack. Yeah, uh, everything that's been said already, it's really all made in the edit um, and like, it, the ability to edit something and take a completely different direction in it. Uh, it means editors hold just a great amount of influence over the final product more so than uh, many other aspects of filmmaking. Right. And it's, you know, it's, it's generally an aspect that's kind of hidden. You know, there isn't, uh, there, there isn't a lot of attention called to it. Uh, so um, uh, this would be again. This would be for those of you who are specifically working with, you know, music and music videos. Again, you know, like Thatcher and Thomas and um, Alex uh, Eccles and Abigail and so on. I, you know, to to what degree did you find yourselves editing? You know, to the beat, uh, and to what extent did you find yourselves? You know editing to the, 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 the lyrics. I think one of the biggest things that we try to do is strike a balance between the two of them. There's certainly kind of a natural flow of a video that can be influenced by the beat and it can make a video a lot more immersive when it kind of matches along with those cuts um, kind of when there are certain moments in the song that it makes sense to do. But also at the same time, one of the biggest things we tried to use was use the, the lyrics of our song. We had the benefit of a song that had some pretty powerful lyrics. Uh, to try to tell a story in itself. And I think making sure the lyrics on the song were matching what was going on in the video was something that was really important and something that a lot of thought went into. So striking a balance between the two, I think was the real priority for us. Yeah. Uh, Abigail. Yeah, so I have a song that repeats a lot, <laughs> which I quickly realized when editing. Um, so I, while I did edit to the lyrics, it was more to the beat of the lyrics. So it was it's sort of a mix, um, but I really tried to use the sections of the song, like each verse or each chorus, to do work as a framework for the emotional development of the video. Yes, yes, uh, which I think you know worked uh, worked very well. Um, Charlie, do you want to talk about that in, in in your case with younger? Yeah, I think something I do similar to what Thatcher was talking about is tr always try to make it something new because it's like really easy to fall into a rhythm and then that rhythm is cool at first, but then it lulls you to sleep and then you got to snap out of it. And yeah. so like, for example, in the, my video, I had like just a plain 
clip of the, the guy walking and I noticed some piano sounds in the background. I was like, I'm going to try to use those for something. And I added some color on each of the piano like notes. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. it's like adding dimensions and creates more depth to it, which keeps it more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and anybody, anyone else want to speak to uh, that issue? I mean, I guess Natan said, you know, the, the lyrics were, were, were less important to him and, 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 and Alex Eccles, I think you sort of answered that, you know, to, to some degree already. Uh, um, so, uh, I mean, it, it, again, another, oh, well, okay. So here's a question from someone for uh, Ica. Oh, how was it working with uh, a, uh, foreign film uh, for your for your what special challenges did that present if any or advantages um well special advantage was that nobody actually understands Korean so I just screwed with the subtitles pretty much at will um, but other than that I think um, let me see um, as to like this song itself at the end, I did, I didn't, it felt strange to use um, sort of like Western music over this like clearly Korean film, but I also felt like it might be a little too cheesy to just use like a straight up Korean song the whole time. And so sort of the song I ended up choosing at the end with like the Korean singing and everything, um, it's Into the New World. It's sort of, it's often called like Korea's like second national anthem actually. It's used a lot for like huge protests and rallies and the lyrics, I mean, it's sort of like a soaring song, I think. And the lyrics go like, I love you just as you are. And sort of, it really tied in with the theme. And I think Jack was really helpful with that actually because I felt really scared about using this song. But then Jack said he actually liked it. So it really made me confident enough to keep it in, so. Uh -huh. Okay, nice. Um, okay. Uh, so probably as much as any genre, right? These you know found footage works are are made uh, in the the editing room, um, and so uh, let's talk a bit about how your uh, videos changed uh, over the process from a written proposal to uh, the finished project. <laughs> And uh, maybe we could start with uh, with uh, uh, Thatcher. Sure, I think there's a pretty clear evolution from my, or I guess our written proposal uh, to the final project of the video. I think part of that comes from the fact that our proposal was kind of vague, and I think intentionally so, just because as much as I ever kind of conceptualize the project, it always kind of seems to take its own path when I start actually getting into the weeds of finding footage editing. So. I think there's definitely a link between them. You can definitely see if that's clear, but I think the final project has some interesting nuances that weren't necessarily realized yet uh, when the proposal was being put together, but pretty clear pathway through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as this is a somewhat related question and then we'll come back to it. Uh, um, JL, do you or, or anyone else uh, get into kind of a zone uh, when you're you're editing, so there's this just a you know this experience of flow where you're just sort of caught up in the in the work and you know everything else is shut out and then you look up and three hours have passed or or something like that. Um, I'd say for myself, like that the the time I was editing before that one time when. I was, when I came to you guys and was like, I'm so frustrated, I can't, I'm really stuck right now. Um, that time I was definitely, when I was editing, I was just like, nothing was seeming to work. Um, I couldn't find videos, it was just very frustrating. But then afterwards, when I finally like realized my my vision kind of, then I definitely got into flow. And it was like, like I said, it was very much my own uh, stream of consciousness that started just coming out. And then it was just very like natural and fluid. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, others, uh, Max, how was uh, you know your experience in that regard? Um, 
uh, yeah, I, I feel like uh, it was like trying to move it from something that just looked like a condensed form of the interview to something that was more transformative. And uh, in the end, I'm not sure I did a perfect job at that, but um, just trying to make it more awkward as it went along. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I, I mean, for the evolution of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Jack, how do you feel like uh, uh, yours is uh, pretty close to your written proposal? Uh, um, yeah, uh, going in, I had a few ideas that didn't pan out. Um, one of which was I originally wanted to have more like questions from uh, I think the name is right at the beginning, but the uh, Chris Wall moderator, moderator Rick Wallace, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I think the big thing for me was uh, we were working with a four minute time frame, mm. and within that four minutes, I found that it was hard to uh, have too many questions. Uh, and while still maintaining a certain pacing with it. Um, so I'd say that was the thing that most uh, affected my final result in comparison to my proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh, Mia, what about um, the, the process for you of going from a, you know, the, the, the written concept to the final realization? Yeah, I think I stayed pretty close to what I proposed because there was sort of more freedom in building the speech myself, but that was also probably the hardest part, building that audio first and starting there. Um, but like trying to reach that end vision um, was kind of difficult, I would say, in terms of finding footage and like balancing that with the audio that I was putting together and how to make it feel cohesive. Um, but through a lot of the feedback that I was able to get in class um, and meeting with Peter on editing lab days, um, mm -hmm. I feel like it slowly came together to be what I had originally proposed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, the uh, you all did a bunch of collaborative projects uh, before the uh, embarking on your final videos. Uh, and I'm curious about, you know, what you learned uh, from your fellow students uh, during the process of, uh, of those collaborations. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with uh, Alex Eccles. Um, I think it was really interesting how everyone, um, seeing how everyone edits and works in a different style and way and able to learn like I had groups that were like started really early and got get go on it and then others that um, uh, like communicated in different ways like through phone and stuff like that and I think um, I think we all kind of like worked around different like challenges of like doing it through zoom but it um, I think you learn a lot from yeah everyone has a different preconceived notion of what editing should be like. So it was cool to um, riff with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, you want to speak to that? Yeah, sort of like I mentioned before, I think the main thing that um, I learned personally was how to like reconcile different viewpoints. Like on some projects, uh, we would instantly like know what we were doing. We'd agree and it would be super easy. But then during others, it would be a little more difficult and um, we'd have to like come to a conclusion that we both thought would work well. And I think that's a super important skill that I was able to develop in this class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the film is a hugely com uh, collaborative medium, but, you know, uh, life is pretty collaborative <laughs> and, uh, you know, many different types of work are, are you know, very very collaborative. So uh, I do like to have uh, as many collaborations uh, as possible um, in my classes. And, you know, it might have been something of an uphill challenge uh, technologically because of the pandemic and, and what have you. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, in terms of the work, 
<laughs> you know, uh, you all produced really, really interesting work. So, uh, you know, in, in that respect, the collaborations, you know, worked, worked well for me. Um, yeah, in a ton. I want to apologize. I like my camera was messing up, but then I like missed the whole like chunk real quick. But. Okay, well, it's good to have you back. Uh, I was going to ask you, um, you, you decided, Natan, to bracket your music video with some audio at the beginning, uh, common, you know, speaking and some audio speaking at the end. And, and can you describe how you came to that decision and why? For sure. Um, I think that, for one, I wanted to talk about, you know, bring in, introduce the religion and introduce the aspect of nature and all that. Introducing the aspect of nature was easy, obviously. I just had to put natural, you know, uh, clips in there. Um, however, like the religious part, because it's not like a, it's not a major world, they're not major world religions. Um, so they're kind of hard to understand. Um, and they're, if, if you see the images, unless you know about it, it'll, it'll you know, sometimes go over your head. So I definitely felt like including those two, uh, you know, audio clips at the beginning and end were a way to frame the video. Um, Cause initially I had it without them. And then I realized, I rewatched it and realized, hey, this makes sense to me, but I'm pretty sure it's not gonna make sense to a lot of people. So let me put in these audio clips at the beginning and end to uh, tailor that story. And initially I had just the beginning. I remember, you know, I showed you guys, I just had the beginning audio um, and then you know, I really wanted something to bring it personal to me. I didn't have time to record. I wanted to record my grandmother doing like um, a ritual uh -huh. um, and put it in there, but it just didn't end up working out. So I was like, let me make it a little more personal and put my audio at the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, JL, when, when did you decide to adapt uh, Tiana Clark's poem, uh, The Eyes Have It? And, uh, and what were the biggest challenges for you with that? Sorry, was the question just adapting to the poem? Yeah, when did you decide to use the poem and then how did you work with it? Um, so I've loved that poem for a really long time. And then kind of when all this civil unrest has been happening again recently, it kind of reminded me about it. And then like the 48 hour film festival that the school hosted actually, I included some of um, the quotes, some quotes from that poem in it because I just really love that poem. And so then it's, and I've always wanted to kind of make something for it, but I just have never gotten around to it. So finally I was like, okay, this is like the perfect opportunity to do it. Um, and like I said, yeah, just not taking it too literally was a big challenge for me. Cause I just felt like that was too easy and I wanted to transform it in some kind of way. And then also movie tote, which I like have posted a few times um, is is a really cool video and it has like it's playing with composition a lot and like multiple videos so I wanted to kind of experiment with that so this was just a great opportunity to do all of that yeah that turned out to be the better reference than uh, love is the message in terms of you know what you were looking for I think um, and uh, okay so uh, uh, Abigail, what, what do you feel you've learned from uh, your fellow students in the, in the course? Working uh, on I, projects together, comments on Canvas, comments on your work, et cetera. I definitely learned the importance of drafts. Like I went back and watched my rough draft the other day before I had gotten all this feedback on it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like an entirely different video, basically. Like the beginning is, is similar and the end is similar, but everything in the middle is different. Um, and then I also learned um, while I didn't use it in my final video, the importance of like voiceover and how to use voiceover. Cause mm -hmm. that's not something I usually think about, but and while I didn't use it because I was trying to make a music video, I, I like learned how to do it specifically from the, um, the trailer project. Well, and you know, it's, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if you should be too hard on yourself about the rough draft, you know, because it's, it's, it's meant to be rough. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the, in, in the other class, there's, uh, there were two students collaborating who, who switched, uh, 
projects after their rough draft. <laughs> they couldn't find the material that they wanted uh, to uh, uh, with the song that they were working with. Uh, so they made a great video about a different song. And um, I, can, I can attest to that, to that because my rough draft was only 30 seconds. So I think you did a little better in that respect too. <laughs> so uh, Aika, what do you feel like you learned from your fellow students uh, in the class? Um, I think I just getting to witness um, everyone's different like senses of humor and what everyone, like everyone's different. I feel like everyone kind of finds different things important. Like some people are really all about like the font or like the music or the editing and just seeing um, those different priorities was really helpful for me to like mm -hmm. become more well-rounded, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Okay, uh, well, uh, we do have another um, screening coming up on uh, uh, of the videos from the other class, uh, which I hope you'll be able to check out. I think you'll be very curious to see uh, similarities and differences to your own work um, there. Uh, and uh, on behalf of uh, all of us on screen, I'd like to thank our uh, teaching assistant, Matt Gannon, uh, uh, for all of his help over the course of the term, uh, and, uh, and also our uh, film video technician, Peter Chardelli. Uh, and, uh, and to the chorus of uh, voices shouting congratulations uh, at the end of uh, Mia's video. I'd like to add my own to all of you. Uh, under the, you know, difficult circumstances of the pandemic, uh, as well as other, you know, significant challenges, um, you produced funny and moving and politically engaged uh, and beautiful uh, found footage videos. So uh, bravo. Um, and, uh, and thanks to those of you who tuned in. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we have another screening. Uh, uh, and that other screening will also be followed by a Q and A with the, the students from that class. So uh, great job! It's very good to see you all again, and I'll I'll look forward myself to seeing you next Tuesday. Great job! Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Thanks, Abigail. Take care. <laughs>